want to take this time to thank you for coming. Uh, it's, it's good to have uh, somebody from the EFF here. Uh, we are a big supporter of them, uh, both in uh, uh, just everything they're doing. We're, we're really excited to have uh, somebody here. They were also on that list of, of somebody we really wanted to reach out to and get them here. Uh, especially you know, at the time, we had uh, you know, the, the idea of patents. And, and, you know, this, so that gives you an idea of how long we really ago we really started looking at this. was basically you know, eight, nine months ago. Obviously, there's been a lot of change in the industry over the last, you know, even a couple weeks. So um, we're just excited to have the EFF here. And uh, Daniel, when you're ready, take it away. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, thanks to Next Day for having me here. It's, uh, it's a good community for us to talk to. We, I'm sort of mostly going to be bringing the bad news today, which is patent trolls. Um, and uh, yeah, I heard it's a hiss, and uh, it's well deserved. Um, so I want to talk about the, the patent system and uh, why patents are getting so messed up in the software space and messing with the, with the uh, open source community. Um, but first I want to talk a bit about EFF. I saw, someone, uh, I saw someone with a member shirt here earlier with the NSA member shirt. Is he here? No. There. If you want to join, you get a really cool NSA member shirt. Uh, so join EFF right now. We got, uh, Offer with uh, with uh, with that uh, that image. Um, uh, so EFF, uh, we're a digital civil liberties group, and uh, we've been uh, we sort of split our areas into two two practices. We have a civil liberties free speech privacy group, and we have an intellectual property group. So I I work in the intellectual property group. I want to talk very briefly about some of the stuff that our civil liberties group is doing right now because. Been in the news, we've been suing the NSA, and uh, we've been suing the NSA since 2005. Uh, a guy walked in off the street, Mike Klein, an AT&T employee, walked into EFF's office in 2005 and said, you know, uh, there's been some guys from the government coming around and they built a secret room in Folsom Street, AT&T's office on Folsom Street, and they're splitting the cable and they're sucking the whole internet off to the NSA. And you know, we knew that back in 2005, uh, thanks to this whistleblower. It wasn't as prominent as Snowden. And uh, we sued them back then. Uh, we sued AT&T as well. And uh, this lawsuit was going pretty well. The, the government, uh, the judge said that uh, there was no way AT&T could have believed it was legal to give the entire internet traffic to the NSA. Uh, but unfortunately, Congress uh, gave the carriers immunity. So we lost that case against the carriers. But um, recently, we filed a new case based on the uh, Snowden revelations. And uh, that's against the NSA itself. And it's mostly going to be a First Amendment argument, where what we're arguing is that the, uh, the carriers, because they're giving all everyone's metadata, all the associations that you have with your friends, with your doctor, with your church, with whatever, the government's taking all that information and that's actually impacting your associational privacy and your right to association as a First Amendment right. And so uh, that's, a, that's a new case we're bringing. Um, so we've been around for a while. This is a screenshot of, from the Wayback Machine of a, of a really pretty EFF page from I think about 1996. Um, and one of EFF's first cases was about freedom to code. Um, we, we, had a, we had a guy who wrote a program called Snuffle, which is a uh, encryption program. And back in the 90s, the government required encryption programs to be registered as munitions. And you had to, under export control acts, and you had to ask for the government's permission before you could sell a uh, encryption software. And uh, we said this was a prior restraint under the First Amendment, and the judge agreed, saying language is speech, and the regulation of language is of any language is the regulation of speech, even I think it was C++, C++ in that case. And so, um, so we sort of see our work in the intellectual property space and uh, relating to software encoding and app developers as part of our freedom of expression, freedom of action uh, practice. We, we have uh, what basically an innovation group where we do copyright and patent-related policy and litigation. 
uh, to give you an example of some of the stuff we've done uh, that might be relevant to, to this crowd, uh, there was a, a researcher, uh, Trevor Eckert, actually I only learned about this case myself yesterday, who discovered the Carrier IQ software. And if anyone is familiar with that, it was a uh, sort of a rootkit program, I think, it was, it was logging keystrokes and other things on people's phones. Users didn't know about it. And uh, Trevor Eckert published information about this, including some stuff that had been on Carrier IQ's website. And they used copyright law to try and censor it. And so we, we got involved and, um, and actually backed down as soon as EFF got involved in that case. Um, so, patent law. Uh, patents are supposed to incentivize innovation, they're supposed to promote the creation of new cool products. But unfortunately, the patent system, as, um, as you're experiencing it, is probably as much of a hindrance as a benefit. Is anyone here a uh, named inventor on a patent? Has anyone here uh, ever been threatened by a patent troll? Or been or afraid of being threatened by a patent troll? Well, hopefully, well, not hopefully, though, I might make you a little afraid by the end of this talk. Um, uh, they are out there, and app developers, and even folks who are at another level, like custom ROM, whatever, you, if you're doing anything that's going to be apparent to someone who picks up the phone and plays with it, patent troll, patent troll could come after you because they tend to focus on the, on the user interface because it's the easiest stuff to make that use of. Anyway, so the patent system, just from some really basic stuff, a patent is, is analogized to a property right. The patent is, is, has a specification, which is a description of the invention, and then it has claims, which are supposed to be like a fence. Uh, to say what, what the patent is, uh, what it covers. Uh, and uh, you file them at the patent office, and uh, the patent office unfortunately doesn't have a lot of time. Uh, examiners only spend about 18 hours per, uh, per, per patent application. They don't look at a lot of prior art, they mostly look at all, all other patents. They don't go and look on GitHub and reverse engineer phones to figure out if stuff's been done before. They would do a really cursory look, and so you get you get a lot of bad patents. Um, I'm going to show you uh, some drawings and titles from some actual patent applications. Uh, here's here's a really excellent patent application on a method of exercising a cat with a laser pointer. Uh, here's one on a method of swinging on a swing. These are real real patent applications. Uh, here's a user-operated amusement apparatus for keeping the user's buttocks. <laughs> uh, here's a pantyhose garment with spare leg portion. And here's a burial structure for the internment of human remains and significant memorabilia. Okay, I'm going to ask, does anyone want to guess what those five patent applications have in common? They were granted. They were all granted, that's right. They, were all, they all became US patents. So the patent office probably wasn't familiar with the idea of burying, burying human remains in a pyramid. Um, so you can imagine how good their review is of a software patent or you know, anything that's complicated. Uh, in 18 hours, uh, they, don't, they don't do a great job. And uh, they're about, uh, the current estimate is there are now about 68,000 software patents issued every year. Um, so that's, you know, it's getting up to about 200 software patents for every day of the year. Each of those has about 30 claims. So if you were to develop a product and think, like, I should check, see if I'm, see if I'm infringing any patents. Like, just to check that the patents issued that day would probably cost you about $3 million in legal fees. It's just not, it's a completely impractical system. Uh, yeah, this is a graph of, of uh, software patents over the years. And you can see it's, uh, it looks like a exponential curve. So what do we get? We get we get toxic waste. We get a lot of really bad software patents. And we get software patents ending up in the hands of of patent trolls. Uh, patent trolls, for anyone who's not familiar with the term, it's a pejorative term for companies that um, uh, buy patents and don't predict, don't produce anything and sue people who do. Uh, it's a very very low risk business model because they use contingency fee lawyers and 
so they have very, very little costs in litigation, but the people who defend have very high costs. Um, any other level order? I took, turn, talked earlier about patent claims, the fence that, that a patent has that uh, sort of uh, says that it gives you the property right. Uh, this is a typical patent claim. Um, I'm not going to ask you to read it because you'll be very, you know, break your head. But um, is anyone just scanning that? Anyone kind of guess as to what that's a patent on? <laughs> no. On pop-up windows. <laughs> so if you you can you can infringe that patent with three lines of JavaScript. Uh, but the claim, you know, the claim itself is written in this just ins indecipherable gobbledygook that looks like it's technology, looks like it's some kind of invention. But you know, there's a patrol who actually sues people for having pop up windows you know, on their websites. Um, uh, so I just I want to talk uh, very briefly about why patents are different from copyright and why patents are so much more destructive to open source than copyright. The, the, whole, the whole premise of, copy, of open source is what's called the copyleft trick. Copyleft, um, a lot of you are probably familiar with that. And the idea is if you have, a, you have an open source license, someone adds to it, someone produces something new, they're going to be bound by the same terms. So you, so you cover everything down, every new fork, everything that's created is also going to be open source. And, and you're protected because in copyright you have to show a copy. If you write an entirely new program yourself, even if someone wrote a similar program before, they can't sue you for copyright unless you actually copied that. And so if you're, if you're adding to something, adding to, to, adding to Linux or whatever, um, you're protected because you're copying those people, early people's work, but you have a license under open source, and, and you're protected down the chain. Patent law doesn't require copying. You can be sued for patent infringement even if you've never heard of the concept of a patent, let alone if you know of the patent. You don't have to. You don't have to copy. You don't have to be familiar with the patent. And so that means people can come out. The, the patent troll can hide under the bridge and jump out and attack you, uh, even though they contributed nothing to your project. Um, uh, so, you know, Pat Troll, I was talking to a friend recently who works in a startup where they're, they're using the MapReduce platform. And I said, oh, you know, bad news, there's a Pat Troll that started, started suing people for, for using a uh, Pat Troll called Pat Parallel Iron is suing uh, Rackspace. The patent is on hardware. Uh, it, you know, it's a really massive leap to claim that it covers uh, MapReduce. But the case is, the case is going on, and my friend said, but I don't understand, this is open source, how can, how can, we, how can they be getting sued? It's because it's a patent. Parallel IAM doesn't, didn't contribute a line of code, but they can still jump in and sue you. Um, so the patent troll, like I said, they, they don't usually own anything except patents. Um, their whole business is suing. They don't usually have documents. The patent, uh, litigation is really, really expensive. Um, so that's their main weapon in order to extract rents from app developers or whoever they, whoever they go after. And the problem is exploiting. This, is a, this graph shows um, the, the light blue line is the percentage of patent cases that are bought by trolls, and the, the dark blue is operating companies. So you can see there's been a big growth uh, overall in patent litigation in the last few years, and almost all of it is coming from patent trolls. Uh, they now it's it's the, the estimates for 2013 is going to be like 5,000 lawsuits brought by patent trolls against uh, around 5,000 defendants. So um, the, the problem is growing, and the the difficulty of defending against a patent troll is even if the case is really weak, even if it's a company like Parallel Line that has a has a patent on hardware, claims it covers some some software, uh, you need to spend real money if you're going to defend yourself in court. This is an estimate for uh, patent litigation that costs, where there's less than a million dollars at stake, it's still going to cost you a million dollars to get to trial. So unless you're a big fish, unless you're Apple, Samsung, Sony, if you're, if you're a smaller company, uh, you, you really don't have an opportunity to defend yourself because it's just too expensive. 
And the patent trolls know this, and so unfortunately they've increasingly been going after small companies. Uh, patent litigation, people used to call it the sport of kings, it's so expensive, it was just the big, big players fighting each other. Increasingly patent trolls are targeting startups, app developers, um, what, uh, hotels, uh, they've, they've been suing cafes for providing Wi-Fi. Um, uh, and they know that you know, um, uh, a corner cafe that has a Cisco router isn't going to be able to defend a patent, patent suit against the 802.11 standard. It's going to cost probably, a patent suit like that would probably cost about $5 million. So they're forced to, forced to sell. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about um, some particular trolls that um, are, are going against app developers. One is a company called Arrival Star. This company based in Luxembourg, they own their classic patent troll. All they do is, is sue their patents on geolocation. And uh, so they're suing mostly municipalities for providing uh, apps that uh, do tracking, next bus, that kind of stuff. Um, but they're also suing the people who are making apps for, for transport companies. And they've sued, I think at, at this point, it's 300 different defendants. Um, uh, these guys, uh, these guys being business, they don't just send letters, they usually just sue. This image is from their website. You can see how brilliant they are because they have this idea of using a computer to track location. Um, and uh, you know, they have these very broad patents. They don't just cover what, you know, they claim that they cover any kind of geolocation. Um, uh, they have not these are, they're suing a lot of people, but they, don't, they haven't taken any case to trial. They're, um, they're really after the quick settlement. My, from what, I, what I've heard is the municipalities, they, they ask for about 75000 which in, compared to the cost of defense is just small change. So the municipalities are paying up, uh, but unfortunately they've started targeting really small app developers. We've spoken at EFF, we've spoken to folks who um, uh, who've had less than $20,000 revenue uh, for the entire life of their company, and they're getting sued in federal court for patent infringement. And uh, this is just complete madness. Um, but uh, the, the, these companies don't have even the, the money to hire a lawyer for initial advice, um, and the, the trolls are still going after them. Um, uh, the latest on Arrival Star is that the um, uh, the American Public Transportation Association just filed a suit against Arrival Star. Um, so that basically the municipalities are pulled together to try and knock out their patents. And they're being supported by a nonprofit called the Public Patent Foundation, who are doing really good work in this space as well. And uh, so they will they will try and knock out these patents, but that could take easily could take two years. So in the meantime, they're gonna be picking off the app developers. So one by one for 10 grand, 20 grand. Um, and then the unfair, I, I imagine since it's a crowd of app developers that, that folks feel that situation is pretty unfair and it, it really is as unfair as it sounds. I mean, these are people who have just done absolutely nothing for the industry. No one's, they've never written a line of code for any of these apps. Um, and they just, they've got their hand out for, for as much as they can suck out of people. Uh, here's a summary of what I just said. Um, oh yeah, we did file uh, a re-examination. That's a uh, a procedure at the patent office where you, you challenge you challenge the, the patents in the office. Um, and we did manage to take out one of their patents, but uh, they have they have a lot more. So unfortunately, you know, uh, it's really hard for for nonprofits. Patent litigation is so expensive. So we we made all this effort. We knocked out a patent, but they have more. They're still going, so we were we were happy to make their life harder, but unfortunately, um, it'll take take more effort to kill these guys. Has anyone ever heard of Lotus before? Yeah. Um, so these guys are uh, another classic troll. Uh, they're a shell company in the Eastern District of Texas. They bought their patents from a giant aggregating troll called Intellectual Ventures. 
the exact relationship between them and intellectual ventures is not is not clear to those of us that haven't seen uh, the documents produced in discovery, but I would estimate based on other cases I've seen that they're sending 90% of their profits back to intellectual ventures, a lot of intellectual ventures claims this is an independent company, we don't have anything to do with these cases. The deal that was made when the, these patents went to Lotus probably mean that IB is getting all of this money. Um, that, that image is an image from the patent. Um, as you can see, it's, it's cutting, cutting edge technology. Um, these guys have a patent that they claim covers all any kind of in-app purchase. Um, the patent is basically about uh, being at a fax machine and being able to, to, to call out to a central office and make some kind of transaction while you are sending your fax. Um, but because of the incredibly broad language of the claim, they claim it covers modern uh, applications on brand new smartphones. Um, so the Lotus update, they filed uh, 27 cases in January uh, against a really big mix of defendants, against some really big, big players like Disney and against some really small app developers. They're suing the small app developers just to put the fear of God into other app developers. I doubt they think those actual cases are worth the money they're going to spend on them. Um, Apple has intervened in this litigation. They're, Apple has a license to this patent. And so they have an argument that their license should cover anyone who's using, every, anyone who's an app developer for, on iOS. I, unfortunately, that license is still confidential. It hasn't been produced openly in this case. And so it's hard to give a real, it's hard to know how likely that case is to win. I, I just want to be hesitant. I think the Supreme Court has been really strong on the idea that licenses should give the people down the chain protection. So there's real reason to think that Apple could end up prevailing here, but this case is going on, and meanwhile, the app developers are getting threatened. Um, Google filed a re-exam against the patent. That's still going on as well. Um, the case is headed to trial, and they're going to try the Apple's license defense at the same time. I know not many people in this room probably do Apple uh, develop on iOS, but um, uh, uh, that should protect that community and the um, the overall trial on validity and infringement will happen in October. So we may get uh, uh, either some very good or very bad news this year on Lotus. Um, uh, and the other, there was actually some good news this week. I don't, did anyone hear about the TMSoft case? I think this is Todd Moore. Um, he, he wrote on his blog about, uh, about Lotus and what terrible people they are. And, they, they didn't like that, so they sued him. They sued him for patent infringement based on a little app. Uh, I think he made about $10,000 in revenue on that app over its whole history, so it made no economic sense. It was clear retaliation for his speech against, uh, against Lotus. And uh, a lawyer called Dan Ravisher of Pub, Pub Patent stepped up and represented Todd for free, and they, filed, they defended on arguing that it was actually retaliation for the speech rather than a legitimate patent case. So they argue a First Amendment defense, and under Texas law, you can get fees if you win that kind of defense. And so that case was really new. I was going to talk about it, how it had just been, been filed. And just, I think, um, Friday, maybe Thursday, this week, uh, Lloyds has settled that case and agreed to drop the, drop the suit. And um, which is great. It's a great victory for Todd. Uh, it's a great lesson in like standing up to a pet troll. And I was really excited for Dan Ravish, the lawyer who did that. Um, but uh, it's something to keep in perspective, though, that uh, uh, Dan calculates that his bills, if he had been paying his like commercial rate for that case, he would have he spent about two, they spent about two hundred thousand dollars in legal fees. And so, so sure they fought bad, sure they won, but it took two hundred grand of free legal services for him to do that. And that's just not going to come around for a lot of a lot of people. So meanwhile, everyone else is, is still is still in the firing line with these guys. Um, uh, I'm just going to put up uh, a haiku. Uh, let's listen to the West Wind. The West Wind seems to say, "This is not legal advice." <laughs> I'm on your alert. Just um, uh, I just want to 
made clear, I'm talking very generally. If you decide how you're going to deal with Lotus based on what I say, uh, if you really if you really need to make a decision about about Lotus or any of these trolls come after you, you probably do want to talk to a lawyer. Um, and I want to talk give give some really general. Uh, ideas about how, if you ever find yourself in the unfortunate situation of dealing with a pet troll, of how, how you might want to deal with it. Um, one thing to remember is that these letters, they make them look as scary as possible. They make it say, you have to do this, you have to do that. You can't tell anyone about it. A letter is just a letter. It's not a contract. You haven't agreed to anything. You can just you know, take a deep breath. Don't panic. It's just a letter. Um, if you get served with a lawsuit, like that's that's a lot more scary. At that point, you have to talk to a lawyer. But if you get a letter, if you're a really small company and you don't have extra money to hire a lawyer, you can do your own research into the troll. There are some trolls out there who, who haven't been suing people. They've just been sending lots and lots of letters. If you get a letter, if you do some research, you find out it's one of those trolls. Maybe the maybe the right thing to do will be to do nothing. Um, and they've done research on small companies dealing with patrol threats. Cheapest thing to do usually turns out to be to do nothing. Um, unfortunately, that's not always true. Um, so uh, if you do find out, if you do talk to a lawyer, particularly if you get a, like you get sued, or if you if you get a letter from a, from say a rival star who are much more likely to to file suit. Um, the key is to find a really work hard on trying to use your networks, talk to other people, try to find a lawyer who understands your business, particularly your size. If you just go to like the local patent specialist at a big firm, they're going to have a lot of really, really expensive solutions for you. And these may not be the right things for you to do. Um, uh, so, um, uh, if you actually end up in a case, you really want to look at whether your own art, your own products perhaps predate the patent. If you can show that to the troll, often that, that can scare them away if they think you're going to be someone in a big case that's going to be going to be a problem, going to just cause them to lose. Um, designing around is obviously uh, a good thing to do if it's, if it's not too hard. Unfortunately, so many of these patents are written so broadly that you know, if, if, the, if the pattern is on you know, a drop-down menu um, and, uh, and you have a, have a website that it's going to be hard probably to, to not use, but um, people really have been sued for having drop-down menus with it. Um, you know, before I get to number five, a lot of people will say, like, don't settle, you know, don't, feed the, don't feed the troll, and that, that's, that's a really good message. Like, troll, troll, you do feed the troll if you settle. You do give them money that they're going to use to hurt other people. Um, so it is like the morally right thing to do is to fight the troll with every last ounce and every last dollar. But like you have families to feed, and you have a business to run, and you have employees, and like, we, we understand that that is not always possible. And so particularly if you have uh, really, really small revenues um, and you've been sued, uh, you know, the best, the best way to get out of it will be to plead poverty. That is feeding the troll, but um, uh, and they will they will suck everything out of you that they can. But um, but it is possible to 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 continue and with small settlements if you can make a case that you've um, got a small revenue. Uh, teaming up. Uh, if, if a lot of people are getting sued, you definitely want to get in a joint defense group and pull resources. Particularly if big companies are getting sued, that's what's happening in the lawyers' this case. Is a lot of big people have been sued. They're fighting back very hard, and the small people are able to sort of coast behind that. It's still, it's still not fun. It's still expensive, but it's not like having to having to litigate all by yourself. Um, the let's skip to eight. Don't be an easy target. Of oh, these, these are sort of adapted. You'll see a URL at the bottom from. Um, uh, Professor Colleen Chan and a lawyer Stephanie, I forget Stephanie's last name right now. From uh, they have they have ten, ten uh, suggestions. So it's, it's a good thing to look at sort of for a first first idea of like how how to deal with patent trolls. Don't be an easy target. What what they recommend is not not making things too public. Um, don't make big announcements unless you have to. So be really careful about how much technical detail you have. 
in announcements so that the trolls don't have things that they can claim. They can then go to court and say, ah, we know you infringe. Unfortunately, in front of an open source community, that's not really advice you can follow because you have to make your code um, uh, public. Um, but uh, but it, it is advice um, you can follow uh, in other areas if you, if you do hardware work um, about say what you need to say in different environments so that you don't have, have things that the trolls can latch onto. Um, so that, that's sort of the bad news um, uh, that these trolls are out there. There are these, these this problem, you might look at this list and say, you know, this really isn't that satisfying. If I get sued, you didn't give me a silver bullet. And the, the bad news is that like, there just isn't a silver bullet. The, um, if they, once they file suit, it probably will cost you a lot of money. There's just no way out of it. Um, but uh, what, what we want to think about ways that in the future we won't have so many patent trolls. Um, has anyone heard of Twitter's Innovators Patent Agreement, the IPA? Um, so Twitter has proposed a new uh, agreement they'll have with their developers that when they file for patent applications. The actual named inventor will sign a contract with Twitter, where Twitter, there's a few features to it, but the, the main thing is that Twitter will agree not to use these patents offensively, and that it'll bind subsequent owners of the patents so that it'll never fall into the hands of trolls. Most patents that are in the hands of trolls came out of bankruptcies. So startups, a lot of startups fail, that's, that's sort of the natural cycle, and the assets that are left are these patents that end up about, I think it's 90% of the patents that get sold at auction end up in the hands of public trolls now. Um, so when you're getting, if you're if you're getting a patent, if any any of your businesses are getting a patent, think carefully about the afterlife of that patent, and that, that try and make sure it doesn't become the toxic waste in the hands of these patent trolls. And one way to do it is to have contracts like the IPA. Um, it's up at GitHub and uh, Twitter's website. If you Google Twitter IPA, you'll find it. There's another one that a former EFF lawyer called Jason Schultz is developing called the Defensive Patent License. Um, it's more detailed. It's probably, um, uh, uh, it has a similar similar idea that the, the it's trying to create a network of people. And you can also, this the DPL will also be a potential cross-license between companies where they agree only to use patents defensively. Um, there are similar things. There are patent pools, as Red Hat and um, Google has a has an open patent pledge. They just um, last week added 79 patents to their open patent pledge and agreeing not to go after open source. Um, but uh, unfortunately, these play and the open innovation networks. Some of you might be familiar with that. Unfortunately, this is only a limited universe of all the patents that are out there, and the trolls aren't bound by any of these agreements. But they are beneficial in keeping as few patents in the hands of trolls as possible, and also in keeping the, a lot of the most dangerous patents out of the hands of trolls, the patents that would really could really go after anyone who's using um, you know, stuff that probably reads on any Android device. Any Also, one thing to remember about patent law, unfortunately, you can be sued at any level of the distribution chain. The OEM could be sued, the, the, the network could be sued. Anyone who's selling the device, and even a user can be sued. This is how patent trolls are going after cafes for providing Wi-Fi, for buying an off-the-shelf router, putting it in a cafe, uh, get a lawsuit. This is a company called Innovadio is doing that. Um, one thing, uh, EFF, we just launched a website called Trolling Effects, and it uh, has a bunch of information about the problem. and. Um, also, it's supposed to be, it will be a crowdsourced database of patent troll threat letters. So if anyone has letters from Loisys, if you get them, you can upload them here. And it, the idea is it will help people keep track of what these trolls are really doing. They, they operate in the shadows as much as possible. So this is going to be a trolling effects, effects .org. Um, the, the database will be downloadable. Um, and. Uh, it's already been useful. We've already gotten a letter from um, uh, the, there's a there's a pen troll that's going after lots of small offices for providing scanners uh, connected to email. So if you 
If you scan a PDF and email it, you can get sued, uh, or they'll threaten you to sue you. Uh, they've sent literally thousands of letters, um, but they haven't sued anyone. These are, these are real bottom barrel folks. And uh, we've already got letters where if anyone fights back and sends a letter saying, you know, I'm gonna, are you really serious? I'm gonna go to court and sue you first. They send a letter backing down. So we've sort of already got out the record that these guys back down as soon as they're challenged. They're just after people who are too scared and gonna send them a check without asking questions. Um, that's what the actual troll is called MPHJ, but they send a letter out under about 40 or 50 different names. Uh, they've set up 40 or 50 different little shell companies and they have six letter names like A-H-H-L-X-Q or something. And so they make it as hard as possible for the recipients of these letters to Google them and figure out like, what's going on. So the kind of folks they send letters to are like non-profits, uh, you know, two-person two non-profit office, disability rights office in, in Vermont got a letter from these guys threatening the patent suit. Um, so trolling effects, we're really trying to collect all these letters and, and bring, bring this activity out into the open. So I encourage you to visit the site, and um, if, you, if, you want, if you get letters yourself, but you know other people who do, upload them. You can anonymise them. Uh, we, we provide for procedural where you can get them redacted before they get uploaded because of the fear that sometimes that trolls are, um, uh, will retaliate against people. But, um, but a lot of people have just been uploading them without redactions, which is good. Uh, I, here's a screenshot of the, the front page. And the other good news is that there is a movement for reform. Um, the White House uh, gave a press conference about patent trolls recently. This is a shot of the White House press secretary. Um, and they, the problem is growing so much. Usually patents are like kind of this obscure area that only, uh, only talked about among lawyers and, and within IP departments at, at big companies. But with trolls going after the little guy, uh, it's really come out um, in, into the open. So there are actually a bunch of bills being proposed right now. Um, uh, there are, I think, actually seven pieces of legislation in Congress pending at the moment to try and deal with patent trolls. None of them are probably going to solve the problem completely. Um, we think at EFF, we think like real reform needs to come at the patent system so that these really terrible, overbroad software patents don't get issued in the first place. Um, almost all patent trolling gets done with software patents. There's, there's no, there aren't pharmaceutical patent trolls because um, it's just too hard to get a pharmaceutical patent and they're too, the language of pharmaceuticals and chemicals is too, too clear. Patent, software patents, unfortunately, it's very easy to find kind of a synonym for, for a concept, particularly things at the user interface. Um, so the, the patent claims end up being very broad. Um, so the legislation that's being proposed, there is a fee shifting legislation that we help push that would um, make a patent troll who lost in court have to pay the other side's legal fees. And the idea there is it, it, it removes that weapon that they have, that they know it's gonna to be too expensive for you to defend yourself. Um, so there may be, uh, the other thing we're, we're really pushing for EFF is some kind of protection for people further down the distribution chain. So if you're, if you're, if you're uh, being just selling, uh, selling an app, but you get sued for, for something that's really provided by, by Google or Apple, and there, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to get pulled in court at that point. It really should be the, person, the distributor, the bigger company that, that, that's defending those products. And so there are proposals that if the, if the distributor intervenes, the cases against the end user get stayed. Those are pretty controversial, but we're, we're really pushing for those. Um, uh, it's just ridiculous if someone buys a Cisco router and puts it in a cafe, they end up in a lawsuit. Especially when Cisco is actually willing to go to court and, and be part of that litigation. Um, it's a lot of stuff, a lot of really specific proposals about transparency. Um, for, so, Lotus, for example, it's really hard to know who's behind that. It took people all time just to figure out it was an intellectual ventures patent. And so, people are, some of the legislation would require patent trolls to say who has a financial interest in the litigation when they file a lawsuit. And another big thing that they're proposing is what's called heightened pleading, which is going to require the, the 
someone who sues with a patent to actually say how it is that you infringe. Unfortunately, what's happened, what happens now is a troll like Lucis who has this ridiculous patent called that came out of fax technology. They can just file a lawsuit that says, your app infringes this patent, full stop. And they don't have to explain why, they don't even have, they don't even have to say which claims of the patent are infringed. That makes it really easy to, to file lawsuits without, without scrutiny, without having to do due diligence. And so, um, uh, it may sound like a small thing, but we actually, we actually think that that provision would, would reduce the number of patent troll lawsuits quite a lot. It wouldn't solve the problem entirely, but forcing them to actually say how things infringe would, would definitely prevent the bottom feeders who, who file really ridiculous lawsuits. And I would, uh, one thing, I would put out a call, if anyone here like ever gets a letter from a patent troll, um, call your representative. Like they, they actually care. Um, yeah, I was pretty cynical when I came sort of from litigation to doing more policy stuff. But we, the, 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 the folks in Congress who are proposing these laws, a lot of them are telling stories that they just had someone come into their office who explained that they had to let two or three people go because they were fighting this patent suit. And they, they cared, they didn't, they didn't need to get a check, they didn't need to get a donation. They, uh, if you come in and you say, uh, like, I'm a business, I'm trying to make something, I employ some people, and I would, I would employ more if it wasn't for these patent trolls, that, that's a story that really resonates, and it's been resonating in the hearings uh, on the Hill that have been happening on this. Um, so I would say get involved. Um, uh, you can track the, the various proposals that are going at our website, EFF.org, um, when, when things uh, really, um, you know, we'll probably have actual alerts where people can can sort of sign and call and details about how to call. But um, really, this is a this is a problem that needs legislative reform, and so the folks that are impacted really need to, to step up and make noise about it. Uh, there are a few. Just wanted to put a call out to other groups that are doing work in this space, particularly for this crowd. Um, is anyone here familiar with the App Developers Alliance? So they're. Um, uh, they're doing, uh, the patent reform is one of their big issues, and um, uh, so they're, they're doing kill visits, so if anyone uh, sort of wants to join them, they'll take you out to Washington, you can talk to your, talk to a congressman. Um, Pub Pat, Pub, Public Patent Foundation are the group that um, defended Todd Moore, and um, in that, that was his case, um, Public Knowledge is an, uh, another nonprofit. Engine Advocacy is a group for startups. So if, you, if, if you're interested in the issue, you can also, as well as checking out EFF, you can check out any of these groups and see if they're, they're good groups to get involved in. Um, yeah, and that's all I have. So I can, I think I have time for, for questions. I read an article um, a few months ago, uh, and it was about, something about with this uh, reform that's been going on. Um, it, they, had, they had put together, I don't know, I don't, I don't really know enough about it, I'm sure you might have heard of it. It was some kind of uh, similar to kind of like Stack Exchange. Uh -huh. to you, you might be thinking about Ask Patents. I was actually, um, uh, yeah, it, it, Ask Patents is, um, uh, is part of Stack Exchange. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a great, it's a good tool. It's way, uh, it's set up in a similar kind of process. You can ask questions and, we actually use it at EFF um, when we, uh, one case I didn't mention, uh, some folks might have heard that patent trolls are going after podcasters, and we're, we're gonna challenge, we're gonna sue the podcaster, this patent troll in the patent office, and we use ask patents to try and crowdsource prior art. Okay, um, so is that, uh, is that being done by um, the patent office? Right, yeah, so, um, so the sign is our patents, and the patent office is partnering with them, um, okay. which, uh, but, uh, and um, it's, they're doing a thing where with pending patent applications, it used to be that patent, patent applications are just one-sided, which is why you get a method of swinging on a swing patent. Yeah. That's a real thing, but it was swinging side to side. It was the five-year-old uh, five son of the patent lawyer. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's no one else gets to speak and challenge, and so until after a patent's issued, and so they've changed that, that now for the first six months after a patent application is published, you can make a submission to the patent office, 
and say, um, you know, here's some great para. Uh, we've been doing partnering with us patents and the patent office, and um, uh, we've been sending para on some 3D printing patents. Um, yeah. I, and will, will that apply to uh, like older patents? No. No, the older patents are still. You there are ways to challenge older patents in the patent office, but they're really expensive. So this. This challenge that we're going to do against this troll going after podcasters, um, the filing fee alone is $25,000. Um, and uh, so we, we did a fundraiser for that. Um, but it really puts small players out. The, the great thing about the program you mentioned that's for pending patent applications is it's free. Yeah. Um, uh, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I was wondering. Um, I mean, a lot of the, the problem uh, about software patterns is that they're patterns. Uh, whereas, um, in my mind, coding is a language. It, there's a reason it's a coding language. Um, uh, and hence, code is text. Uh, and hence, it should fall under copyright law. Um, is there anything being done to educate lawyers and lawmakers in this regard? So that, I mean, well, yeah, I hear. Um, it's it's a really difficult uh, problem that that the software patents have become have become really embedded in the in the patent landscape, and really big players have developed really big portfolios. So IBM, Microsoft, and the, the current reform debate in Congress is not really directed to that. There is a little bit of movement to, to making software patents less broad and vague. What, what's called functional claiming is where the claims cover any solution to a problem rather than a specific proposal. And that would that would improve things, but it would not be the solution like getting soft patents out of the entire software space. Um, and if, if we've had kind of a difficult decision in how to navigate this space, um, because like there's a lot of people call on us like why do you propose these small fixes? You should just be pounding the table, all software patents, all software patents. But right now that's not really uh, a hot. There is a movement for reform, so we think we want to get some reform. Um, at the same time, we want to educate people that there is a problem here. Software software doesn't mix well with the patent space. We want to lay that groundwork, but. Um, uh, that's that's going to be a long battle, and I think it's going to be, uh, like realistically speaking, a really hard one because like there are people are spending billions and billions of dollars to buy software patents portfolios, and, uh, and so there's well, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, vested interest. Um, I you know there are other folks in the space, the Free Software Foundation, really sell that message. Um, we we've tried to 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 talk about patent trolls and explain that patent trolls are a software patent problem, um, so that uh, so that the legislatures, the people in Congress, understand that. Um, uh, and I would love to see a bill that said no software patents, but it's not going to it's not going to come soon. Um, quick question: uh, Why is it that a recipe for like cookies is not subject to IP? It's but it's components and logic and steps, right? Yeah. Uh, what what makes software just this completely different beast than like mother's cookies recipe? Which yeah. You can't have even like General Mills can't have the, the rights yeah. to that recipe, yeah. right? I actually in, in answer to the early question and answer this question, I, I shouldn't um, I actually should should clear up we're we we are not really pursuing the no software patents in Congress right now because there's just no audience for it. But there there is possibility that we'll get a better better ruling out of the Supreme Court. And the reason why we have software patents and not recipe patents is because the Federal Circuit, which is the Federal Court of Appeal that hears all patent cases, is just incredibly pro-patent. And in 19, it was until the mid-90s, it was not really clear if, if software was patentable. And a lot of people took that attitude. It's like, this is math. I don't know if any, and if you did like logic, form logic, it's like the church Turing thesis. Like anything that's programmable, you can do with a pen and paper like that. It took a long time, but like that, that that's like all these are all theorems. And the, um, uh, why, why is that in the patent system? And the, the Federal Circuit just, 
took, took the ball in their own hands and in 1995, in a case called Alipad, they said, oh no, anything, a general sort of computer is patentable. And so they're basically saying, well, a programmed computer is therefore patentable. That, that, was their, that was their reason. It's, it's pretty much exactly what they said in the mid-90s, and that just like the floodgates. So, so yeah. is there a country we can flee to? I mean, is it, <laughs> does the opening it up to international jurisdiction make you more or less? Yeah, I think the airport in Russia, in Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does, uh, does the patent landscape to you get more hopeful or less hopeful when you open it up to every country has this? Yeah, system? I mean, this is the problem. Like, Germany just clarified that um, software, patent, software is patentable. They, they passed a new bill. And New Zealand, which is not my hope, if you detect an accent, it's Australian, not New Zealand. Um, uh, New Zealand just passed a really good bill um, make, uh, clarifying that software is not patentable. But the problem is, is you, know, you do business here. So um, uh, you're, you're going to be subject to the law here. I had uh, uh, two short questions, but I think one of them was already kind of touched. Like, what is the difference between US and Europe, for example, regarding the patents? Because I heard that in Europe there's no such thing as software patents. Uh, so, for example, I was thinking that if a company is scared about in a payment, so, uh, yeah, so program, then would it be a solution to sell the software on Google Play only in European countries or? Yeah, I mean, people, there were people that left the US market because of voices. Um, and uh, and just operate in Europe. Um, uh, the um, uh, Europe doesn't have software patents. The thing, the the big argument in in cars against the idea of getting rid of software patents is, oh, it's so hard to, to draw the line. Like, what is a software patent? You know, what's not, like a lot of things could be done in software or hardware. And my, my response to that is always that like, there are there there are lots of difficult questions in patent law, and this is the right difficult question to have. And you should, so we should keep an eye. So that that's how it operates in Europe. Um, the other the other big difference in Europe and Australia and Canada and a lot of other countries why they don't have patent trolls is because um, it's often overlooked, but the, it's because of the fee shifting. If you bring a case, if you bring a case in Europe or Canada or Australia and you lose, you have to pay the other side's legal fees. So it makes it makes just suing people for these nuisance suits much harder. Um, but in America, if you know, if you like Newegg, um, just be a patent troll. All they went all the way to trial, they lost, and then they went to appeal and they won on shopping cart technology. And they spent um, they spent nearly ten million dollars on that case. They're not getting any of that money back. And um, uh, uh, and it's great that Newegg stood up to this patent troll, and it was a patent troll suing a lot of people. Um, who was using a shopping cart online, pretty much, any of the big players. Um, that case probably wouldn't get born in Europe, or because at, they would know that the troll would know if anyone actually did fight it all the way to the end, they would owe the other, other side $10 million. Um, um, so it's not actually a substantive uh, difference, but it makes a big difference in practice. My, uh, my second question is uh, regarding prior art. Uh, prior art uh, um, well, uh, long ago I saw a website which was something called like Pyro Art Machine, which was randomly generated, well, apparently nonsense sentences like, I don't know, a coffee maker which was all makes fake computing or whatever, based on a huge scene. Uh, I mean, it, it was fun, basically, but the question is that could it actually be used as a prior art in case uh, for a certain speed, uh, random number of uh, seed it actually generates something which matches a patent? Uh, that, that, is, that is a very difficult question. I'm going to pass. I don't think so. But. Uh, excuse the cynicism, but given the current state of Congress, how confident are you that the pending legislation working through there now will eventually see the light of day? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Congress has done, you know, they're, they're, other than like changing the name of a bridge, like there's really almost no legislation gets through at all anymore. This one, um, this is actually one of the few areas where there's cause for optimism. The White House has said really clearly they want reform, and uh, there are bills being proposed by in both houses, by both sides of the uh, party. So Goodlatte, uh, Chairman Goodlatte in the Judiciary Committee, Republican in the House, would usually be, the Republicans in the House are usually the roadblock in, in the legislative process right now. 
He's proposing a pretty good bill. So um, uh, Schumer is proposing a bill in the Senate. Um, uh, Schumer's, that's, and Schumer's a case where people went to him in New York, startups, and explained what was happening with patent trolls, and he really he got fired up about it. Um, so there's, there is actually, it's one of the very few areas where something should happen. We're afraid at EFF that it's going to be pretty small and that not a lot of it, but um, so we're pushing for, for the bigger changes that are on the table. Um, not getting rid of software patents, unfortunately, because that's not on the table, but we're, we're up to this. Uh, hi, yeah, I just wanted to say, um, uh, I was actually just awarded a patent from a previous company along with some other people. Um, and so my question is, you know, as a developer who's maybe moving through different companies throughout his career, um, what can I do to like help this problem? I mean, should I just start, you know, telling uh, people, you know, like, oh, I respectfully decline to help write a patent or something? Yeah, and that, it's hard. I we, we talked, we we get that question a fair bit. Um, there's a guy at Apple who donates all those patent bonuses to EFF. Um, uh, the um, uh, so that's a great idea, but um, more seriously, um, uh, I think like you could be a voice for for trying to do these different kinds of licenses, like the IPA, where where you're still going to get the defensive portfolio, but your company's making a commitment to not be a patent aggressor and to to openness. Um, and uh, and the other thing is, I think, is to stand up to them if they if they're asking you for to patent something stupid. We get, we get people who confess to us that they got patents on things they knew was developed in the open source community five years ago, but the boss just kind of bullied them into it. And so I think ultimately, you're, you know, if you're an engineer, you got people higher up the chain, they, they want to patent something, you probably have, have, have to do it. But if it's something that just you know doesn't deserve a patent, tell them. Because they actually had, they had ethical obligations. The lawyer who files that patent has an ethical obligation to be aware of the prior art. So, so if you really know it's stupid, you can talk them out of it. And then the other thing is to look at these things like the innovators patent agreement, defensive patent license, and see if you can talk talk other folks into developing an approach that protects them but doesn't create the toxic waste. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks.